into week two of the official TSF Movie Night podcast featuring yourself, uh, yours truly, uh, Akra, and my co-host for the day, TSF Charlie. G'day, g'day, g'day. How you doing, Charlie? I'm, I'm very well, thank you. Excited to get into the dumpster fire that is Blake himself, Bortles. Yep, good to at least escape from the dumpster fire that is normal everyday politics. Uh, and, you know, as much Indeed. as politics change, sports, well, it changed slowly. So we have that to look forward to. Um, on Indeed. that note, let's get started on what our topic for the day is going to be. Uh, we figured it would be a good day to visit one of the teams in the AFC South that's been struggling this year. Um, and they really, they've been struggling for a few years, but the, the, uh, the hype around them was that they had finally enlisted a lot of help on defense and more specifically that they suddenly had, um, a, a plus rated quarterback, that their quarterback was going to be good. And that team is the Jaguars. Yeah. They were a team that was getting like Vikings level of hype and, like it was, it was crazy. As as a as a potential like sleeper team, they were they weren't even a sleeper anymore. They weren't a dark horse because everyone wanted them to be good. And so I think that this is why it hurts so much that Blake just sucks. Yeah, and you know the rest of the the rest of the teams in the AFC South as well. You know this was supposed to be the year of the AFC South in a lot of ways. Uh, the Titans thought Mariota and yeah. their offense was going to be amazing. The Texans just enlisted Brock Osweiler. We know how that's turning out so far. The Colts still have Andrew Luck. That's just all they have is Andrew Luck. Uh, you know, so there's there's a struggling. Um, they've had recent success, but it's still a fairly struggling division in the AFC South. But today, what we're going to do is we're going to break down Blake Bortles specifically, and we're going to pay attention to whether or not we feel like he really is as good as everyone was trying to make him out to be. And I think the conclusion so far is that we may have been missing some of the reasons that he was hyped up. And so what I think the format we're going to try to continue with, guys, is that we're going to try to bring you 20, 20 or so, 30 minutes maybe of more detailed analysis, uh, a little more fast paced. So you're not forced to sit through, you know, an hour long video or something like that. But we'll try to put these out on a more regular, consistent basis. Uh, we have exciting new um, projects that we're probably going to be working on in the near future. So stay tuned for those. And without further ado, um, why don't you take us into our first clip? Kind of set it up All for right. us. So here we are seeing the first game is going to be Jacksonville at Tampa Bay. It was the start of last season. Hopes were high. Um, and as you can see, the Jaguars are already down. And this is going to be a consistent theme. Of right. The year. And so this starts, this, this play comes at the end of the very first quarter when they're already down by three points. And this is what I think is a good glimpse of Blake Bortles, maybe when he's at his top form. And so I'm going to go ahead and run this clip of what we're going to see. And I'll pause it here for a brief moment so we can talk about this. But, you know, this is obviously the Jaguars. Blake Bortles right back here. And um, what we're going to see is actually a good, accurate, brave quarterback. Something that doesn't uh, happen as much in 2016. But we'll give you kind of your first glimpse at it. And, Charlie, if you want to just talk us through what you're seeing as they're going. Yeah. So as we can see already, everything is out of the shotgun um, in this in this offense. Oh, and so the thing that Bortles does well is he really muscled that ball in. Like his arm strength is great. Like it was probably his biggest plus coming out of college, out of UCS. And we can see that he stands up tall in the pocket, standing up very very strong and he's a he's a big guy and so he's got a very clear line of sight over the whole field because an issue that was is often talked about with smaller quarterbacks like Drew Brees and Russell Wilson is that they can't see over the heads of the linemen whereas Bortles he's 6'5", 230 or something like he's a big guy and so we can already see how he can see the whole field and then really muscle the ball in. Yeah, and that's something I want to right, pay extra right attention to as well. Number. Right there when he throws it, there's a lot of... Um, actually, we don't need to do that. We can just come back here. But uh, this is key as well, right? And this is this is him not worrying about the pocket. He's, he's paying only attention. Look where his eyes are the whole time, down the field, right? 
he puts it exactly where it needs to be. He sees coverage out here in the center, and he he knows that regardless of coverage out there watching even where he's looking, he can still get a good, accurate pass into that receiver, and he's unafraid to do so. He has, let's I'm, see, how many people rush in this pocket here? He's got four guys so, coming. Yeah. yeah. It's a four-man rush, but using simulated pressure with a, with a dropping uh, sugared line, uh, linebacker. Yep, and then, so this is good coverage. He has a pocket with which to work. He has a nice line of sight. But the important thing is to watch what this guy's already doing, right? This is a quarterback that knows he might be about to get hit from the backside, but his eyes never leave downfield. He sees a uh, a defender in coverage, and he's still able to put a perfect uh, pass exactly where it needs to be for a 24-yard game. And the thing that he does well is he knows that if he puts the ball out in front of Hearns for Hearns to run onto it's going to be intercepted. Whereas he puts the ball right on the numbers, which still allows Hearns to make a play after the, after the catch. But it doesn't put the linebacker in a position to make a play on the ball. Right. And which is something that, you know, a lot of quarterbacks, especially this season, are struggling with is, is the confidence to be able to lead uh, a receiver and have it risk being picked off, but still taking that chance anyway. You know, we, we hear guys like Ben Roethlisberger who still, you know, um, there was a, a recent, uh, an article that said that Brock Osweiler or not Brock Osweiler, one of the struggling quarterbacks this year had asked Ben, uh, you know, like what, what is his strategy when he's throwing a ball that could be intercepted? Like, how does he recover from it? And he says, look, I'm a gunslinger. I'm going to throw the ball and I'm going to try to give my guy the best opportunity to make a play on. And I think that's something that's missing a lot from quarterbacks this season specifically, and we'll see it really drop off from what Blake's able to do. But as we transfer into this next play here, or it's not the very next play, but it's just at the beginning of the second quarter, so very soon after the last one, uh, that 24-yard pass sets us up for what's going to be a touchdown pass here. Um, so it's just the beginning of the second quarter. Uh, Jack's, or the Jaguars still have the ball. Good field position, and Wani talks through this play. So again, clean pocket. He does step up slightly, um, but for the most part, the protection is very good. See how we can kind of he can move into the into the pocket, and then with the way that he steps up, it allows his lower body mechanics to be pretty good and push through the ball and really finish off. And it's interesting that you bring up mechanics because this is something that we really want to. Um, stress as well about Bortles as a quarterback as a whole is that one of the reasons that we feel he may have been a little overhyped is that he he didn't really have as developed mechanics yet because he was still a more recent quarterback in the NFL. And suddenly, without all the pressure of performing, because his team, you know, they were struggling, they went 5-11 and 11 last year, but he was seen as someone who constantly brought success, regardless of the end score or regardless of you know, the actual numbers, he was seen as being someone who was expected to fill in, but uh, went above and beyond that call that he was actually exhibiting uh, remarkable quarterback traits and that he could be the franchise quarterback for this 2016 season. Um, And this is one of the reasons why. And it's because he was given such nice pockets. He was given such freedom and no pressure to try to build these mechanics. And that's exactly what you see, as you were saying, that he's able to exhibit all of those mechanics at their at a high level on plays like this. Yeah, and something that PFF has shown is that we can see all the throws that he's made that are really nice are when it's coming off no pressure. And this year, when he's being pressured more, we're really seeing him struggle a lot. Yeah, yeah and I think a lot of uh, pressure in general is something that the AFC South is specifically struggling with when it comes to quarterbacks, you know, because now there's pressure on... Um, and we're going to transition into another clip here pretty quick. Um, but you know, it's, it's every team in the AFC South right now is struggling with pressure and Brock Osweiler struggling to be the $72 million man or whatever it was he, he earned, you know, and Andrew Luck struggling to be the guy that can keep being Andrew Luck and have receivers that'll catch balls for him. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, a, what is, what does pressure really do to a quarterback's mind in scenarios like this? Like what, what, what can they do to be successful with this amount of pressure on them? Yeah. And I think that something that has shown the impact of pressure on a, on a young quarterback is someone that played for the 
Texans a couple of years ago. Uh, the brother of, of Derek Carr, David, he was a number one pick overall a few years ago, and he was sacked the most times um, of a quarterback in the first three years ever. And um, and so, he, like, the psychological impact that pressure has is a huge issue that can sometimes be career-ending, as we've seen with, with Carr. All right. So as we transition into this next play, this is another one where he does something well, and what that is is that he scrambles. Uh, and it's something that Blake Bortles is not known for. Um, you know, he's, he's not known as, as a Marcus Mariota-style scrambler um, with, you know, an immense amount of athleticism. But if nothing else, this play should uh, prove to show us that he had a lot of confidence in his ability to move the ball down the field regardless of what it took that was his main goal, was finding a way to put numbers on the board for the Jaguars. Right there. Beautiful. So this is actually a really good read because the coverage downfield is really good, but it's man coverage. And so all of the, the players in the defensive backfield back are turned away from Bortle. And so that gave him a huge running lane. And because he read the pocket quite well and he stepped up um, through the pressure, we can kind of see this on, on the blitz, how he kind of, yeah, squeezes right through that gap. And this That's is a really, really brave thing to do. Right. And this is huge, too, because what I want to point out specifically, because the next play is really going to hammer this home about how he loses this confidence. Look how close these guys are to grabbing. And his first instinct isn't to try to run out sideways or because this is this is this is actually key that we'll see on this first angle that I already passed up. Um, Watch this receiver that's running out to the flat. Crossing route goes all the way out here. You know, there's. Well, if the pocket doesn't collapse as hard in here, and I didn't see that at first, but you know, this is what, uh, that's a read where instead of trying to force it into a, a play that wouldn't have been good or try to, you know, get it out to the guy on the fly by running parallel with him when, you know, when the pocket collapses, he doesn't try to just escape the pocket. He tries to go upfield. And I think that speaks yeah. a lot to the amount of confidence that he loses in 2016. Um, and I have the perfect play as I'm going to transition to that fairly quickly since I know where that one is. Um, to really show <laughs> the pressure, uh, so to speak. And it's the very first game of the season for the Jaguars. And uh, this is the broadcast. Um, so here it is right here. And this is... This is big and indicative, I think, of... And this is a play I've had to watch before before I get started on this one. This is a play I've had to watch so many times to see if there was anything else he could have done. And I think at its core, it's not a bad play. He makes the right move to throw the ball away. He has no receivers open. The problem is that it's a panicked look that he gives on the first pass attempt of the game, because the two previous plays of this were runs, immediately you start to go, hmm... Where, where's that intimidating Blake Bortles that you have to worry about everything he's going to do? Like, where's not only the, yeah. the confidence to throw a good pass, but also the confidence to, hey, there's a hole here. I might as well run through it. But instead, and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about, he chooses to do this. And this is a really tone-setting play for the rest of the year because this is his first pass attempt all year. And it's just... It's not a good one. Mm-hmm. Like, I understand that y- they're playing good coverage, but he just, there's nothing there. He had a clear running lane up the middle, and he just rolls out, makes a bad read, and then, and then throws it away. Look, there, there. Yeah, his, sorry, I'll go back. His hole up the middle is huge, but it seems like he's. He's now he's now more aware of his body in a sense that makes him reconsider this, and it's like he lost all of that courage that he built up. Not only that, but it, it's it's 
it's a uh, it's such a surprisingly panicked when you watch it from this view. He he's just checked down all the receivers, right? He does a good job of checking all of them, which um, I'll actually go back and watch that first, so we can see that he does do a good job as a passer of seeing immediately, looks down, looks across, looks up, nothing. He sees that all three of them are covered, and that's a good read by him to see that he has no open plays. Everyone on the field is heavily defended. So it's good that he does something else with the football. But just like Charlie was saying, this is not the thing you want to do with the football when you have this lane in this exact situation, pretty much, almost the exact same play, he has this lane to get four or five yards. Look at the same exact route that's drawing the same exact defender off to the same exact side and leaving him this lane. This is good blocking. Yeah. He has such a good yeah. view of this whole field from this good blocking by the offensive line. And watch this jump. Oh, crap. You see that? You see that? Ah, oh, that's it. I'm yeah. done. Yeah. You know? he, picks, uh, he picks to panic when he still has that lane. There's still – look how many – this is an extra dude. That's like, nah, we got this. This is done. We don't. I don't need to help this block because it's that well blocked. This guy's like, eh, whatever. You're not getting off me. You can, you can get your hand on my helmet. Do whatever you need to because you're not getting off this block. This is a good yeah. blocking setup. And he panicked. I wish the Vikings blocked like this. That's what I'm saying. This is good offensive line play. And this is what makes me really dislike a quarterback. And I, I think Blake Bortles is one of the ones I've seen to do it the most frequently. When he's like, all right, there's no play, he sprints. He's like, okay, I know. This is the key, though, right? He says, all right, I know there's going to be at least one guy running this direction as well with me. And maybe I can turn it into a dump route on the sideline. And worst case scenario, I'm outside the pocket, so I can at least throw it away. It's a good decision. It's not a bad decision from a playmaker, right? It's not a bad team leader decision to throw the ball away, get another down. Obviously you're not getting sacked. You know, that's a good decision. The problem is that there are braver ones and more productive ones that he does not take. Yeah. And like, it's, it's so, it's so frustrating because you can, you can say, it, although we weren't watching all 22 for all of that, you can see that the linebackers have just completely cleared out of the middle of the field and there's absolutely nothing there. And so if he'd, if he'd felt like it, there was yards and yards that he could have made. Like, I don't see why that couldn't have been a 15-yard game. Exactly. And actually, this is interesting. Uh, the, the very next play we're going to see, this is where I think it's possible that Blake Bortles, among all that pressure and among, you know, the plays being um, – unsuccessful just very previously this is the same exact drive two plays later uh and this is this is bad and this is this is what we see and this is why i'm only showing these two clips from this game in 2016 right now because the key points are here and these two plays alone because this is what we have um as what blake bortles is now and this is not pretty Three receivers to the right. Okay. Yeah. No. yeah. Mm. So we're going to watch one more view of this, and we're going to go back to the first one. But why don't you talk <laughs> us through like what you're able to see so far? This, this is the kind of quarterback play that makes me think, well, I hope Teddy's going to be okay. Because <laughs> just check the release. Like... The ball, people talk about throwing ducks, but that ball, like, flips vertically in the air. That's yeah. the definition of a duck. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a horrible spiral with that good of a pocket. Look at, you know, room, time. What? Why is the ball that direction at this point in time yeah. in the air? That's not okay. And then... That's where it lands. It hits behind him. And it, it's you could argue that it should be caught, but really uh, Alright, now I wouldn't even argue that, that ball I, I would not argue that, that ball should be caught. I understand that it's a catchable ball, but in my mind that ball should not be caught. Like that's not the fault of the receiver. Now the other thing I want to point out here is this is right when he's about to throw it, right? He throws it to this receiver. What what is yeah, it that you see, see from the rest of the, the field? Ball in the air. Yeah. What what's going on with his lack of vision to the rest of, of open 
of open receivers. I mean, this is a more open route than this is at this point because this is very much on coverage. This is not. This is yeah. a. This is a play that you have to be careful as a quarterback because this is you sending your guy into danger. Whereas, for example, this crossing route, that's at least. Well, I mean, first of all, he has a he has a lead on his defender. If he gets it, he can turn up field immediately. He's even cutting back inside to make it easier to put that ball in his hands. Yeah, and and I think that's our, our, our Alan Robinson, like out up near the up past just past the forty five. Like he's it, it looks like he's also coming back to the ball to make it easier for Bolton, and so. And he's like right in that line of sight and just trying to get that. He's over trusting his arm at a point where he hasn't earned that trust at that point of the season yet. Yeah, no, I think that's that's incredibly relevant. I think, you know, not only can you make the worst decision out of those four, but if you're going to at least throw it well, right? Yeah. And then the rest of it is just kind of an unfortunate, you know, bobble up, et cetera. But uh, Green Bay does get it back, even though they fumbled it after they intercepted it, which is always a ridiculous play. But So I think the, the main themes that we're trying to get at are here in, in these two plays and the plays that we showed in 2015 and the fact that Blake Bortles may have had success in 2015, but really there was just very little stopping him from, from being able to develop his skill set. Uh, and the question now is, where is that skill set? Um, and so I think this 20 minutes of, of film should be more than enough to really explain how our, our view of Blake Bortles is being an overhyped quarterback. Um, but just before the end, there we were discussing beforehand, and the, the place that we feel Blake Bortles is going to be at in the near future actually differs pretty drastically. So as we yeah. move into this this very brief hot takes uh, ending to our show here, um, I believe Blake Bortles has Brian Hoyer esque um, attributes. I think he plays well when he's not under pressure. Um, I think he's a, he could be a great backup quarterback, and I think that when you know if he's given those moments that aren't aren't under pressure, like Brian Hoyer with with the Bears this year then he could really shine. And he could be more consistent, I think, if he's not expected to play every week at a high level. Uh, so I think that's where he belongs. Yeah, I have a pretty contrasting view on this. Uh, beforehand, I compared giving Blake Bortles a second contract to Eddie Lacy getting his second contract. Because <laughs> Eddie Lacy and Blake Bortles, they've both had... One good year on a, where they were the focal points of the offense. It was Eddie Lacy's best year, I think, was the year that Aaron Rodgers was bad. Um, and Blake Bortles was, and still is playing on a team that he's the only option. Like, they, they don't have a ground game. And Eddie Lacy, for various reasons, has not been able to be fat, but he still has so many concerns about being a football player. Like, he said that he hates football. And Blake Bortles looks like he hates football with the way that he's playing. Like, I understand that he is a, a player with so much, like, draft capital invested in him. And that's why I think that he will get a second on track. But I don't see him being a 10-year veteran Pro Bowl player. I see him maybe even out of the league within the next few years. I don't think that he is a good player. And like, if he if he doesn't keep developing, then the arm talent, the arm the arm strength is clearly there, but the arm talent, I don't think is to a, 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 as much of an extent. And we've also seen in that second Green Bay play that. The mentally, he's still not there. He forces balls. I just don't think that, as a backup in in the situation that that Jeff's envisioning, I don't see him being consistent enough to be a backup quarterback. Like, I I want him to turn it around because I love gunslingers. Like, Andrew Luck is my favorite favorite football player. But honestly, I just don't see him doing it. 
because so, given given that you don't expect him to stay in the league for for uh, a veteran amount of time, then if he You've said that you, you believe it's possible for him to turn it around, but given that he doesn't, how long do you think he remains the Jaguar-specific starting quarterback? I think that if he doesn't turn it around by the end of this contract, then he's gone. If he's not playing at a relatively high level, I'd say relatively high because... If he if the ground game suddenly develops, then he doesn't need to be as good. But if he's also not playing at a level that would kind of be conducive to a good ground game, where he's limiting turnovers as as much as he can, I don't I don't think that he's going to be the starting quarterback of the Jags past this first uh, past this first contract. Maybe the situation that I could see is they draft someone like Lamar Jackson next year because there's no way that they're going to be anywhere near the playoffs within the next few years. So I could see them with a high draft pick in 2018, taking Lamar Jackson, letting him sit. That would be the final year of Blake Bortles' rookie contract. Lamar Miller then has a year to sit. Lamar Jackson. Sorry, Lamar, Lamar Jackson has a year to sit. He has a year to learn an American football system, a pro-style system, even though Louisville is sort of pro-style. Um, but there is a lot of shotgun in the Jacksonville offense, which plays into Lamar Jackson's strength. Because he doesn't, he doesn't run anything out of, out of under center in, in Louisville. So Jacksonville has a predominantly shotgun-based system. I'm, I think that they use it like top five in the league for, uh, in terms of percentages spent in the shotgun. But yeah, I, I just I could honestly not see him being the starter for Jacksonville by the end of this contract. So Jacksonville then that's put already so much time and effort into saying that, okay, well now we have a quarterback and, and good receivers. We're going to invest in our defense. And now that defense still isn't playing all that well either. Uh, when do you see them being competitive then? I mean, there's, you know, now that they've, they've struggled and they may not have the franchise quarterback that you thought within the next, I mean, you've already said that they won't be near the playoffs in the next few years, but are, do they stay relevant at all in the next few years? Do they compete or do the, is the next, you know, five, six seasons just building an offense. I think that by the end of this year, Gus Bradley is gone and they bring in an offensive head coach because Gus Bradley is a former Seattle DC who's now, this is his first head coaching gig. I could see them bring in an offensive head coach um, and a new defensive coordinator they then make Jalen Ramsey and Yannick Ngakwe the two focal points of this defense, and they just build around them. Dante, Dante Fowler is a trash football player. <laughs> he is you, not fast enough to be a speed rusher. You heard it here first. Like to be a, pardon? You heard it here first, folks. I'm Look, you can doubt me. There is significant evidence, the fir- foremost being... Uh, Justice Mosqueda's force players uh, analysis on playma- playmakermentality.com. Everyone should go check that out. But it does show that Dante Fowler cannot bend around the edge and he's too slow to be a speed rusher. He's also not heavy enough to be a power rusher with just like a pure bull rush move. I understand that Dante Fowler is perceived to be athletic, but he can't, because his ankle flexibility is so bad, all that a, a tackle has to do is just push him a little bit downfield. Then he can't right himself and can't literally bend around the edge. You'll see videos of, of two, I know I'm a Viking, so I'm a, you can hate on me, but the two bendiest players in the league, in my opinion, are Everson Griffin and... Uh, and uh, Von Miller, sorry, I went, I went a little blank for a second, and Von Miller. 
these two players, the way that they bend around the edge, like their elbows nearly touch the ground in a lot of instances. Right. And that allows them that if they do get sent downfield, they can come from behind. And you you can see this in the way that they get their sacks. You can see them come all the way around the edge. And because they're so fast and because they're so bendy, they can they can come in and, and get the sack. That's right. what Dante Fowler struggles with. So hopefully they can they can at least bolster the remaining parts of their defense that need the bolstering and manage to yeah. at least draft a quarterback or someone that can in some way help Bortles perform better or replace him in the near future. So last question yeah. before we before we decide to sign off, uh, who do you take for this Sunday's matchup between the Jaguars and the Texans? It's just like we again we briefly discussed this before, but it's just going to be a dumpster fire like. It's, it's not going to be a fun game. I'm taking the Texans because it's a team that can generate a lot of turnovers, and I think that you're playing against a team that is very turnover-prone. Um, and so I, I do think that it's going to be the Texans, but if you've, if you've got game pass, if you've got any other way to avoid it, then just steer clear of that game. Interesting. Um, I also am taking the Texans. I think that... Um just their defense is more consistent and beyond enough to hold Blake Bortles to not putting up any offensive points while Brock Osweiler figures out a way to get the ball in the end zone slowly with then taking his own time since Jack Jacksonville shouldn't really provide much of a threat there. Um, no. But we appreciate you guys joining us for this episode of TSF Movie Night. We hope you'll join us for future episodes. Hopefully those will come a little more quickly than, you know, once a month now that we're going to get in a little more regularity. Um, but, that's all for today. So we hope you enjoyed it. We hope you preferred more of a, a shorter kind of condensed version of movie night. And we'll try to bring you more of this kind of content in the near future. Um, so uh, I have been TSF Okra. You can find me at on Twitter at TSF uh, Okra. No underscore. I used that one. It doesn't exist anymore. So just TSF Okra. Uh, you can follow us at the sports fellas on Twitter as well. Um, we have a SoundCloud with our podcast on it. We have a website, thesportsfellas.com, uh, where we post regular betting and fantasy advice. And mm-hmm. also there's my co-host here. Yep, I am at TSF Charlie. Um, as I say, you've got to go check out Playmaker Mentality, their force players metric. It's phenomenal. I can't, I can't speak highly enough of it. But right. yeah, so yeah, this has been episode two of... TSF Movie Night. Uh, We are signing off. Thank you for listening.